Hello everybody, this is Dr. Kat Fleece from Central New Mexico College in Albuquerque, New Mexico. In this particular video, we are going to primarily focus on a process of bone development that occurs in the fetus, more specifically intramembranous ossification. But before we delve into that particular form of ossification, I do want to call your attention to a few other things. First of all, ossification is very often also referred to as osteogenesis. Recall that osteo means bone and genesis of course means the creation of, the making of, the start of. Um, in some ways we can also call it bone growth, but most of the time when we talk about the development of the skeletal system in the fetus, we do tend to use the terms ossification and osteogenesis. There are two major forms of ossification in the fetus, and as I said, we'll focus on this first one, which is intramembranous ossification, and then we will take a look at endochondral ossification in a different video. Now, both these forms of ossification in the fetus start around uh, the time that the fetus is about six to eight weeks old. So pretty early on. Now we can't forget the fact that once we're born, our bones continue to develop and then we'll talk about longitudinal bone growth and there's even a synonym for that, appositional bone growth. And then we find that in adults, really bone remodeling is the only process that occurs, which is actually also occurring as you can see in each one of the other time periods, namely, we'll see bone remodeling occurring uh, from the moment that our skeletal system begins to develop in the fetus, continues in the growing children, continues into adulthood. Like I said, we're going to focus in this video on intramembranous ossification. Only a few bones arise from this particular process. We're going to see that it is going to be a number of the flat bones in our skull. For instance, your parietal bones, your frontal bones. Uh, just to give you a few examples, be sure you know examples of flat bones in the skull. And interestingly enough, also our clavicles. Before going into the details of how intramembranous ossification occurs, I think what we should do first is remind ourselves of what a typical flat skull bone looks like. Remember, a flat bone is going to have compact bone tissue towards the outside. I'll just represent that as such. As a matter of fact, I often say that the compact bone tissue represents the two pieces of bread in a Swiss cheese sandwich. So let's say that these two layers represent your compact bone tissue. And then we have indicated by the crosses our spongy bone tissue, better called the ploey, in between. So we refer to this spongy bone tissue in flat bones more often than not as diploe. So be sure you put these two little dots on top of the E, which are referred to as an umlaut. This again is compact bone tissue. And then let's not forget that we must always cover our bone structures with a double layered periosteum and I'm going to just keep it kind of simple and just kind of do like this um, and I'm hoping that you remember that the periosteum that surrounds any of our bones is consisting of two layers with the outer layer being a fibrous layer lots of collagen fibers in there, and then the inner layer consisting of many of our bone cells except for the osteocytes. So that's where we'd find the osteoblasts, the osteoclasts, but also the, 
the bone stem cells that give rise to the osteoblasts, which are called the osteoprogenitor cells or osteogenic cells. So let's keep in mind that this is our goal. This is what we need to get to eventually, or this is what the ultimate result should be of intramembranous ossification. So I'm going to get started here in the top left of the screen with what we see in the embryo developing or having formed already at about six to six weeks or so, um, six to eight weeks, where or in those places where we would expect to see the formation of these flat skull bones and even the clavicles. And so initially, I'll refer to to number one. Initially what we find in these areas, and of course I'm going to show this to you in a very sketchy way, very uh, very simplistic, but what we, what we find is just these lots of fibers um, in this particular area where we want to form a flat bone with mixed in between some mesenchyme cells. So I'll just draw them like so. And they're just sort of scattered throughout. Remember, mesenchyme cells are the cells, the stem cells of pretty much all of the connective tissue. Of course, that includes our, our bone tissues as well. Well, what's going to happen once the ossification process kicks in is that these mesenchyme cells, they're going to start clustering towards the center of our structure that supposedly is going to become this flat bone. So I'll just illustrate this like this and the fibers will still be present, they'll still be there, um, and we'll still have some of the cells that are not totally in that clustered grouping. We'll just illustrate it kind of like so. But the fact that we see the clustering happening of these mesenchyme cells indicates that we have begun to form a primary ossification center. I'm going to abbreviate that, primary ossification center. What we'll do now is focus on that primary ossification center. But what you need to bear in mind is that really towards the periphery of our structure, things are starting to happen as well. But we can only focus on so many things at a time. So let's just focus on that primary ossification center. So once we have these mesenchyme cells clustering like that, what we find is that they slowly but surely start to differentiate and they are going to differentiate into osteoblasts. So I'm going to try to show them more as almost, osteoblasts tend to kind of look more cuboidal, like so. And we're still going to have some, well, we're still going to have fibers, and we're still going to see some mesenchyme cells as well, scattered throughout because of course everything is just occurring gradually so some of these mesenchyme cells are indeed differentiating into osteoblasts. So these more square looking cells are the osteoblasts. Now all of you know what the role is of an osteoblast and so I'm going to show you an isolated picture of my sketchy osteoblasts right here kind of cuboidal looking, um, but their role, as you know, is to secrete osteoid. That is what they do. So they will start secreting around them onto those fibers that are still present around them, those black fibers I am showing in the three other pictures. And so this material that they secrete called osteoid, remember what that is. It is basically bone matrix that is not mineralized. And what is matrix of any connective tissue? It is consisting of um, fibers as well as all of the other organic molecules. If we were talking about mineralized bone matrix and not osteoid, then we would also find hydroxyapatites in the matrix. But that is not what's 
osteoblasts secrete. They secrete osteoid, which is more fibers. They surround themselves with more fibers and the other portions of the ground substance, but none of the calcium or phosphate of other, or other minerals. At least not initially. Not initially. What will eventually happen when, after these osteoblasts have secreted osteoid, is that calcium and phosphate and other minerals do get deposited. So eventually we are going to see that, I'm going to just do little dots like this, we are going to see that in the osteoid we are going to find that minerals will start appearing. So the osteoid does eventually mineralize. And these mineralize, these, I'm sorry, mineralization, these minerals do arise from, or do come from those osteoblasts themselves. Okay, we're still talking about these osteoblasts. When these osteoblasts get surrounded by hardened, um, bone matrix, in other words, when the minerals have invaded into the osteoid, these osteoblasts are going to be triggered to become osteocytes. So when they become surrounded by the hardened matrix, they become osteocytes. And remember osteocytes, um, we're getting kind of crowded here on this diagram, but if I draw an osteocyte, they're going to be more branchy looking cells, um, like so, more or less. And of course, these branches are eventually going to merge with canaliculi, and these osteocytes sit in a lacuna, which is what I'm trying to draw here, like so. So these osteoblasts, eventually become osteocytes that sit in lacuna. And when does that happen? When the osteoblasts have become trapped in their own mineralized osteoid. So when minerals move into the osteoid to form the hardened bone matrix, we find osteocytes. So let's go to step four. And again, going to oversimplify it. Let's, so let's say that we still have some mesenchyme cells in our rather primitive structure still, and we still have, you know, fibers out, and besides, our osteoblasts are producing osteo, osteoid that has fibers in it as well. So let me just draw like three osteoblasts, I should say, um, and the little arrows coming out of them imply that they're secreting osteoid. And slowly these osteoblasts are becoming osteocytes. But during this whole process, as they're secreting the osteoid that becomes mineralized, clearly we're producing bone matrix. And that is eventually going to lead to the formation of trabeculae. So in our next step then, I can slowly but surely start to draw, draw little crosses and just assume that there are osteocytes and still some osteoblasts in between. Um, but osteocytes are, are basically part of these trabeculae now. And then here and there, there might still be an osteoblast in the process of secreting more osteoid. But so now we're slowly but surely forming these trabeculae. At the same time, we still have not really talked about what's going on towards the periphery of our structure. And so let's now um, start incorporating that information. So I guess we could call this our fifth, pictures, fifth picture. These mesenchyme cells that are sitting closer to the periphery, these guys right here, let's say, they are actually going to turn into periosteum. So they differentiate into periosteum. Now, is this really possible? Well, if you think about it, yes, because mesenchyme cells can give rise to any connective tissue. Periosteum is made up of a bunch of collagen fibers in the fibrous layer, and an osteogenic layer, which is a bunch of osteoblasts, osteoclasts, osteoprogenitor cells, which again 
arise from mesenchyme cells. So in picture six here then, we're still continuing to form our trabeculae in that primary ossification center while we now have something going on towards the periphery and that is we're forming our periosteum. And don't forget that our periosteum consists of two layers. This is our fibrous, fibrous layer and again we're going to have osteoblasts as well as osteoclasts in the osteogenic layer that is beginning to form. So these bigger cells imagine that they are osteoclasts. We haven't said much about the osteoclasts, but they are going to play a very important role as well. So we have our trabeculae forming in the primary, os I'm sorry, in the ossification center, and we have begun to form our periosteum with its osteoblasts and osteoclasts and actually you can assume that some of those cells are osteoprogenitor cells as well. Once again we're going to see that these osteoblasts will start secreting osteoid and they do that onto the existing spongy bone tissue that is developing. Now, even though the secretion of this osteoid by these osteoblasts is not occurring in the ossification center that we just discussed before, anytime osteoid is secreted by these osteoblasts, it will go through the same process we discussed earlier. And that is, the osteoid becomes mineralized, this traps the osteoblasts, into their own mineralized matrix and they are triggered to become osteocytes and the mineralized osteoid slow, slowly but surely forms trabeculae. So here we have osteoid secretion by the osteoblasts. It becomes mineralized and that leads to the formation of trabeculae. Now remember, for a typical flat bone, we do not really want to have trabeculae here and there. We do want trabeculae in the center of our uh, flat bone, but towards the periphery, just deep to the periosteum, but superficial to the diploe that we're beginning to form, what do we want there? We want compact bone tissue. So interestingly enough, what we find is that the trabeculae in this area here where the osteoid is being secreted by the osteoblast which gets mineralized and eventually forms the trabeculae, the trabeculae continue to grow and grow and widen and eventually they merge together. And it's the merging of those trabeculae that ultimately leads to the formation of compact bone tissue. So the trabeculae, I'm going to just say trabeculae, um, grow wider and fuse to form compact bone tissue towards the periphery only, so not towards the center of our structure. And so we, I'm going to now get a little bit sketchier, so here is our periosteum, here is our compact bone tissue that is beginning to form by the fusion of the trabeculae, and then here we have our trabeculae that have also already formed. Now very often, by the way, we refer to the trabeculae in the ossification center here that um, are forming this immature spongy bone tissue. We refer to this collectively more often than not as the woven bone tissue. In other words, woven bone tissue is just um, 
an immature form of spongy bone tissue. Remember, we still need to see the invasion of blood vessels, red bone marrow needs to be uh, deposit or developing, I should say, in between the trabeculae, in the holes that are formed by the trabeculae, um, and so on. And so what we're looking at here now is very much the same picture that I initially drew of our goal, and that is the goal is to form a flat bone with spongy bone tissue in the center, covered with compact bone tissue, and then towards the periphery, our periosteum. And so this pretty much sums up intramembranous ossification. Now before I wrap this up completely, I want to um, alert you to the fact that the next ossification process has many similarities. For instance, Osteoblasts are always going to have the same function, and that is secrete osteoid, and that osteoid then gets mineralized, and as it becomes mineralized, we form trabeculae. In some areas, the trabeculae remain and persist, and in other areas, the trabeculae are triggered to continue growing wider. In other words, the osteoblasts continue to keep secreting um, the osteoid that gets mineralized to make bigger and bigger and thicker and thicker trabeculae that get so wide and thick that they ultimately fuse to form compact bone tissue. The other thing I should mention here as well, which I, I haven't addressed at all, but you should always, always, always keep this in the back of your mind, and that is that we will always see Oops, this should be number seven, sorry. We should always see or remind ourselves that the osteoclasts are always busy as well. If osteoblasts are busy, more than likely the osteoclasts are busy as well or soon after the work of the osteoblasts. And their job is always to perhaps remove some bone tissue that was deposited where it doesn't really belong or bone tissue that needs to be a bit thinner in, in its thickness, or they may need to shape those trabeculae better, all kinds of things like that. So I always think of the osteoclasts as your sculpturers of your body. So that's that for intramembranous ossification. We'll do endochondral ossification next. Hi, this is Dr. Kat Fleece from Central New Mexico Community College in Albuquerque, New Mexico. We will focus on 